some tips and tricks to PMT. My name is Becky Matias, and I'm a consultant here at Yalen Healthcare Solutions. Leading us today is Rita Owens, who is the Vice President, President of Clinical Solutions here at Galen. Together, we have many years of healthcare and EHR experience. We won't say how many, just consider it a very large number. Thanks, Becky. <laughs> um, so we have a lot of information to share with you today, and we do expect to run the full time period. Um, we will be getting started in just a moment but we do have a couple of housekeeping items first. Um, note that your phones have been muted. However, you, you may submit questions during the webcast in the chat area, marked in red on this, on this screen. Um, we will have a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. Okay, so let's just take a quick look at our agenda. Um, today we're going to be doing an overview of the problem mapping tool. We'll be taking a look at IMO versus medicine terminology. Rita will be talking to you briefly about installing the problem mapping tool. We'll also be discussing the components and mapping percentage requirements. There will be a manual workflow with the problem mapping tool. And we'll round it out with some lessons from the field and some strategy considerations. Rita, that brings us to our first poll question. So I'm going to go ahead and open that poll. So you should all be seeing it on your screen now. So in regards to the problem mapping tool process, my organization has, A, have you completed all of your mapping and you're waiting for, for an upgrade? Or you've downloaded the tool and you're, and you're in the process of mapping now? Or have you downloaded the tool and you've been waiting anxiously for this web chat and you have not started actual mapping yet? Or are you in the planning stages for PMT? We're just going to give everyone um, just a little bit of time to go ahead and put in an answer. <coughs> So about half of you have answered so far. And they're still coming in. And let's just give it just another few seconds. Still, still trickling in. All right, we're going to go ahead and close that poll. And Rita, it looks like half of our folks on the call today, um, they've downloaded the tool and they're mapping now. And half are downloading the tool, but they haven't actually started the mapping because they're waiting for your great advice today. <laughs> Good deal. So, Ms. Rita, just who needs this mapping tool anyway? Well, Becky, as soon as I can get my slide to work, I'll tell you. Sorry about that, folks. Having a little trouble with my slide. There we go. Okay. So, welcome everyone. Some of you know me. I looked at the registration and I see an awful lot of friends out there. Um, so, who needs the problem mapping tool? Well, actually, every client, every one of our clients who are going to be upgrading to 11.4 or 11.4.1 are going to need to use this problem mapping tool. So let's talk about that a little bit. Um, Allscripts has developed a new process, which um, some of you are probably aware of, the speed to value S2V for the upgrade. And we talk about stages in that. And so there are four stages of that upgrade. But today I'm going to focus on stage two, which is referred to as the prerequisite stage. And as part of the prerequisite stage, there are certain deliverables that each client will need to perform or take care of before Allscripts will actually give you a upgrade date. 
you know, so this or excuse me, before a slot can actually be confirmed. And so I've listed here a few of those items, but for our purposes today, we're going to be talking about the problem mapping tool. Now, why do you need this problem mapping tool? So it's a part of 11.4. There's certain areas of the enterprise product where medicine will no longer be used. And Allscripts has chosen to use the IMO interface terminology. Now, IMO interface terminology is a product of a company called Intelligent Medical Objects. And this interface terminology contains over 260,000 terms and concepts that are mapped both to ICD-9s and ICD-10s. Their mappings, um, their IMO terms are mapped to a HEMA certified mappings of ICD-9 and ICD-10. And the, the terminology basically is that expressions that clinicians most want to use um, for, in, for, in, excuse me, for documenting diagnosis and problem lists and history terms and what we're finding to be consumer friendly terms to be used for like personal health records and of course clinical summaries and portals. So that's why this is important. You'll notice just a few of the vendors here that I've listed that have also already or are choosing to go with the IMO interface terminology. Now, we've got a lot to cover today, so I'm going to not co cover a lot of things in real detail, but I do want to stop here for just a second. Remember, I said just a minute ago that there's a few areas where Allscripts has chosen not to use medicine, so I want you to be sure that you understand it's not everything. Medicine's not completely going away, so you will still need to make sure that you take your medicine updates as they come, because as you can see at the bottom of my slide here, there's still areas that even after we go to upgrade to 11.4 that we're going to still need medicine, and you can see surgical history some note cheek complaints, but for our purposes today, we want to make sure that we focus on those areas that after the upgrade, after 11.4, these areas that you see here will no longer be available in the medicine format to use, for you to use for your clinical documentation. So problems, both the active past, family, and social, as well as the problem linkage to note forms, we'll talk about that, care guide problem linkage, and of course the charge and those items that are associated with charge. Now I want to make something really clear. Blake, Becky and I have been doing this for a few months now, and it's always interesting to me that people keep bringing up to us, well, we don't have to have ICD-10 in October now, and uh, what about the ICD-10? So I want to make sure we're all clear about something, regardless of what all, what, regardless of what CMS and the whole ICD-10 ICD mandate would be, or and if in fact we end up going um, having to use the ICD-10s by 2014, clients would still need to use this PMT tool prior to upgrading. This is not about a, tra a conversion or a transition from ICD-9 to ICD-10. We're mapping medicine term descriptions to IMO term descriptions. We're converting from one interface terminology to another. So it's important that you understand that and that you understand that the ultimate goal of this problem mapping tool is to convert those medicine terms that are currently being used on your patient's charts today and those medicine terms that are a part of your build work to equivalent IMO terms to those clinically relevant IMO terms. I can't stress that enough. We hear a lot, and that it's so often that's just what's confusing is people are getting too fixated on the ICD-10. So remember, regardless of what CMS did, all scripts had already chosen and made their decision to do this, and we'd still have to do it with 11.4, okay? Now, um, a couple of things, like I've mentioned, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about installing the PMT because Allscripts has done a really good job on Client Connect. There's um, a lot of information. As a matter of fact, if you haven't done so already, I um, encourage you to make sure that you join the user group, which is the Enterprise EHR Upgrade Resource Center, and all of the information that you'll need about the PMT is going to be there. Um, also, once you actually put in and you submit your request for an upgrade for support force, you'll get a welcome letter, and that also contains all of the information. It contains also one of the points that I have here on my screen today. But and, and Becky and I working with several clients over the last over the summer, we've noticed that a lot of people are missing this one, and this is really important. Um, 
we need to make sure that you understand that prior, prior to installing the PMT tool. Now, and it's in the welcome letter, but um, it's surprising how many people are missing this. And it does affect the frequency numbers that you see right off the bat. Prior to installing that PMT, you want to make sure that you've updated your medicine. You've taken the latest update of medicine, which is supported by your particular version. Okay? So we all know, depending on which version of that you're on currently, which one will actually be supported, all right? You want to also make sure that you install the latest note form release and install the latest care guide release. And there's a reason for that. When we get in more into the problem mapping tool, I explain why that's important. Also, and as part of that upgrade process, there's a database that lives on your production server where we actually move things back and forth during the upgrade. Some people refer to it as the expert only database basically stands for transfer-only database. Um, Allscripts recommends that you keep this database on there during the entire upgrade. It's basically just move, it just brings in clinical data. It really shouldn't be um, removed, but just in case, just make sure your tech ops guys know to leave that on there because it does affect what we see in the frequency numbers, and you'll see that in just a few minutes. Now, um, PMT is installed in two places, and again, I like to point this out um, because, you know, we're so used to doing things with upgrades starting in our test environment first and then, you know, moving over into production. But this is different. Your PMT is going to be installed in your production, so it's going to be installed on your production database server as well as on the workspace where it's actually going to be mapped to. Now, having said that, if you happen to be a client that has an exact copy of your production database, then, of course, you can do it there. But the point being that you want the most up-to-date information because we're going to go in, what the problem mapping tool is going to do, is going to go in and query against that production database, against your works database. So we don't want all that information that's in test. We want the most current patient information that you have. So just a reminder there that it is going against your production database unless, of course, you have a copy. Um, the other thing in the problem mapping tool, Allscripts has, del will deliver two mapping files. Now, one of those mapping files is the problem mapping data file, and it contains approximately 5,000 medicine to IMO default problem mappings. All right. The other file is the diagnosis map file, and that is the default set of ICD-9 to IMO problem mappings. Now, the other thing I want to point out about the mappings here is that the clinical content team at Allscripts basically went in and looked at went in and looked at the client base to determine those mappings that were needed for those that had the highest frequency of use, and that's what they've done. And they've also gone back and if they they mapped the medicine to IMO when there was an exact match. An exact match, and that's important. So, like I said, we have 5,000 here, but there are going to be some that fall out, if you will, from that exact match, okay? And that's where we talk about the mapping that we'll have to do. There simply were just some terms that could not be mapped one-to-one -one and exact, so we didn't want to do that. Okay, now, we're going to log into PMT in just a second. Um, before we do... I uh, want to make sure that you you understand when we when you're logging in and you're putting in the server information here that you're going to it's a lot like your SMT that we're all used to where you're going to be telling the utility telling the, the application here what server you want to run your information against and that's what you see here we're basically here in my screenshot. Um, that's just what I'm talking about. The database server that I'm going to be pointing to, I have my tool pointing to, is in this case would be my production works database. Okay. Now let's go ahead. Let me just give me just a second so I can switch. Of course, it has logged me out. That's okay. Whoops. We'll get right back in there. If the old gal can remember her password. Okay, so here's the problem mapping tool. Now, guys, I have got this pointing to a test server here, like a, a sandbox, if you will. But you'll notice what I wanted to point out here is my server information. So you're going to need to put this information in, okay, and then the login information here. 
And in this case, I have the problem mapping tool administration security. There's two securities, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Okay. Now I'm logging in, and for some of you, this might be the, your first chance of actually seeing the problem mapping tool. Now, this is the home page, and there's a lot of information on here that you can read, so I'm not going to read it to you, but I do want to point out a few things. First, there, here's your version in the far right corner. So the latest and greatest version that is available to us now is 1.3.48. This version actually was released in June of 2013, and it is, again, the latest and greatest. You want to make sure this is the version that you have. If you don't have this version downloaded, then you don't need to start. You need to go get this new version and download this version. Okay? Um, let's see. This came out in June as well as the mapping file. So let me come over here now. So I want to talk about the admin page. So you'll see there's four tabs. Let's talk about this one. And there are four sections in here, and they work independent of each other. Now, in this case, what you see up here is frequency programs. And then some of you have already started or if you've already been reading about the problem mapping tool, you've heard the term frequency. Now, what this is basically going to do is as I check the different boxes, now remember I've got it installed on my production server, and then I've also got it somewhere like on a client side desktop where I'm working from it. And basically what I'm going to do when I check the different boxes here, let's just do one. Let's, we'll do this one. The patient instance data. When I check this box, you'll notice that my run button becomes active. When I click run, my problem mapping tool is now going out and querying against my works database, my production database, and going to bring me back my frequency information. So here is another tip. Don't do this during um, the workday. Don't do this during, um, remember, we're querying the production database. And granted, it only takes a few seconds. And in my environment, remember, guys, I have this pointed to a test environment which has very minimal fake patient data in it. So you see it came back very quickly. But as Becky and I have been working with clients over, with this over the last few months, there are times it takes a few minutes. And I have to tell you, the first time I clicked that run button, and you can, you can click all three and hit run, but the first time that Ms. Rita clicked that run button on a real live client and it sat there and span, span, spawned a few minutes, I was a little scared. Um, but everything was fine. But again, I do want to point out, you are pointing towards the production environment. Not a good idea to do this during the work day. Okay, because we really don't know anytime you're pointing against it. This is the same kind of precautions that you would take with SSMT. Just remember that. So now what it's doing when I run this frequency, it's going to come back and bring me the information that we're going to go back and look at on our dashboard in a few minutes. So I've gone out there and I've told it to basically give me the numbers of my ICD-9, my build, my charge build items out there. I want to see what I've got there. I want to see specific patient data, what's on my patient charts and how much of it, how many problems, how many times that problem is on a patient's, on specific patient's charts. And then also these particular medicine problems, how many of those and where are they and what are they that are attached to my build items, such as care guides and note forms and flow sheets. Okay, that's what this section's for. This second section is your Allscripts mapping data file. And you'll notice over here that it's basically the two files, remember the two files that I spoke about, one that maps to the problem. This is the 5,000 medicine to IMO mapping file that I mentioned. This is the ICD-9 mapping file, two different files. You can see here that what I see on my screen now is that it's letting me know that I have um, downloaded and applied. Very important, I've downloaded the latest file that's available from all scripts, and I have applied it. So it's not enough just to download it. You have to apply it. Now, the thing about this one is we're not touching your production environment here. You're basically going out now, and we're going to go out through the URL, and we can 
go out and see if, if in fact, there is a, a newer version of this. Now, I happen to know there's not. And I don't want you to think that this is something that you need to be checking every time you log in. As a matter of fact, if you make sure that you join that Client Connect user group for upgrades, as soon as you log in, if, in fact, there was a new file, it says it right there on the screen. You can't miss it. But, again, this is the latest and greatest file, and it came out on June of 2013. All right, but let's just say for some reason I hadn't been in here for a couple of months and I wanted to see, I could actually click this here and it goes out there and looks for a new version for me. Now, if in fact there is a new version, you'll notice that my screen is going, this button is going to become active for me, but because there's not, I don't need to apply anything. There's no new version there. Okay, this box is refers to our secondary codes, and I'm going to wait to talk about those until we get in the application. I found when I try to explain these to people from the admin screen before you've ever actually been in the tool, you get really confused. Just know that when I start talking about secondary codes, that this is the box where I'm going to, when I refer to turning it on, this is where you would turn it on, okay? Um, the lot problem mapping data, I want to make sure you understand what this is. This one has confused a lot of clients. They read this, and we're so used to the term users being those users in our system. What this really means, and what all scripts really means by this, is the PMT user. Okay? So remember, I mentioned that we have two securities that come along with the PMT tool. One is the PMT admin and then, of course, PMT user. And so the PMT admin, of course, has full rights. But the PMT user might be someone who's going in and maybe working with the person who's in charge of all the mapping or who's responsible for all of it. Um, so this is where you can lock down the additional users to the PMT tool, whether or not they can do anything, okay? So if it's unlock, the users can basically get in there free, the PMT users can get in there and work right along all together, changing, mapping, doing things. Not really a good idea if you have several people working in the tool at one time. Um, the lock only the approved maps, so basically as we start approving our mappings, um, and that a word approved is going to be important in a few minutes, and I'll show you why. But the um, in this case, if I've already approved something, I can choose this option and lock it down. That if I have others, the PMT users locking in, well, excuse me, logging in and working in the tool, they can't overwrite the things that myself as the PMT administrator has already approved. And then, of course, just fully locking it down. Absolutely no changes at all. And my understanding is this is the um, the box that. The upgrade consultants for all scripts will recommend, obviously, the weekend of upgrade. And then, of course, this is our problem search location where, depending on um, if you're pre-upgrade or it's during this time, whether or not it's the information is loaded locally or if we're going out and hitting this information in a cloud and bringing it back from IMO. Okay, so we're not going to worry about that right now. Let me go back to my slide. Give me just a second, if you will. And, okay, now, we, I mentioned about the mapping, and I want to make sure that everyone's clear that there are three levels of mapping that must be completed before that you can get a tentative go-live date from all scripts, all right? Um, and it's funny because as we've been doing this, we've had several clients reach out to Becky and I, and they'll say, oh, we're at 80%, and we'll say, 80% what? And they'll say, oh, I've got this at 50%, and they'll give us one number. And what we're finding is that clients don't really understand there's truly three levels of this mapping that must be completed. You'll notice here that I have two of these in kind of the blue color, and that's because those two are affected by that problem mapping file that Allscripts delivers. Remember the file that I mentioned to you, it was the meds into IMO. And then the third one is the build diagnosis, which is that separate file. The other reason the other two are together is when we begin our mapping, we're actually going to begin mapping on the tab that's, that is specific to patient problem list. 
and to the patient problem instance data. As we map the items in here, they will trickle down, if you will, or they will auto-populate. They will begin to fill in those items that are as part of the build as well. Okay, so I won't have to do it two times. But what's important to understand is the things that I map up here in these two items, okay, they do not roll over into build diagnosis. That's why I like to point that out that it's differently. Okay, these two will work together. This last one works separately on its own. Now, when we talk about the patient problem list or the instance data, what we're talking about in that mapping is when we look at our frequency numbers, it's going to show us the problems that we have in our production environment that are documented on our current patients right now for active problems, past medical, family, and social. It's also going to show us those same problems that are on a specialty favorite list, user list, care guides, those that are on note forms and flow sheets, and it's going to tell us how many times. That's the frequency that we're talking about. We're going to go and look at that in just a second. When we talk about the bill diagnosis, you see here I've got it in green because diagnosis in this particular one, I want to make sure you understand we're talking about charge here. It's charge. That's exactly what it is. And for me, charge is dollars and dollars are green. And this is really important that the, what we're talking about here that's going to get mapped. Pay close attention because there are some pieces that won't get mapped, and we're going to talk about that. So it's going to map your um, master favorites, your subgroups, your user favorites, exploding sets, and past di diagnosis. What we're talking about here is a conversion from the meds and terms that may be on these particular lists, converting them to IMO terms. Now, on Client Connect, there's a lot of documents that pertain just to PMT. One of those is the Problem Mapping Tool Mapping Complete Checklist. And this is a great little document. I think it came out in April, I want to say. Um, and it basically is the checklist with the recommendations from all scripts as to um, what the percentage, the mapping recommendations that they have. But I want to point out a couple of things because I've had a couple of clients already say they were confused about this. So you'll notice, remember I said the three. So the patient instance data, yes, it has its own line on that checklist. And what it's saying here is that Allscripts is recommending that you must map 80% of your problem data before you know you will be um, given that upgrade date. You'll notice here when we talk about the build problem, it's not one row, it's not one category, it's these, it's all of these. So when we talk about that second level of build that needs to be completed, it really is five different areas, your care guide, your flow sheet, your note, all of that encompasses your build. And for each one of those, it's important to notice that it um, is specific to clients as when we talk about these exceptions, you'll see why. But you'll also notice that the MACBEAM recommendations are different for each one of these, which is why you don't see the one line for this. Okay? So now what I want to do, I want to log back in and let's get into the problem mapping tool. Let's see. And I'm sure, whoops. Okay, so remember what I said here that I had I ran my frequency numbers? So let's go look at our dashboard and see what those are. And it's exactly what you're, you'd be thinking about a dashboard. Now, there are four columns, excuse me, four tabs across this dashboard, but the two that you are concerned with are the ones that have the word frequency here, okay? And it points this out in your that checklist document, but again, um, with the first time you log into this tool, I think it's a little overwhelming when you see all these tabs and you'll miss really exactly where you need to go in this one. Remember, we're looking at the frequency of this. We want to see what's specific to your environment. So let's go ahead and look at our dashboard numbers. Now keep in mind, folks, I actually ran my frequencies against a Galen test environment. And so my numbers are going to be just minuscule compared to what you guys are going to have. I mean, we've got clients, obviously, that this number here is 70, 80,000. Okay? So remember, my numbers are smaller. Let's talk about what we have here and what this means. Now, 
I wish this number I wish this row wasn't bold. I should just let Larry Trusky know that. <laughs> In any case, I just wish this one wasn't bold because this really isn't the row that we're interested in. We're really interested in those below that, and I'll tell you why. So we're, this is the instance data, and this is the row that is referred to in that checklist document. Let's talk about what these different columns mean. So here, what this is actually saying at 60,000 feet, and those of you who have uh, worked with me before know that's one of my favorite terms, what we're saying is that in my test environment, or if this was real my environment, I have 430, okay, 430 problems, okay, that are on patient charts, 430, okay, and of those, I have a defined mapping. Where did I get that defined mapping? From the All Scripts mapping tool, okay, from the, excuse me, from the All Scripts mapping file now. So, if if I choose to approve and accept the mapping file that was delivered from all scripts without doing any further mapping, 90% would already be mapped for me. Well, that's pretty good, right? All scripts is saying on patient instance data that I really only have to have 80%, okay? So 90%, keep in mind my number, I'm against, I am also pointing against a test environment. What this column is telling me is there's no defined mapping. That means that 45 of my problems actually fell out, that when the Allscripts clinical content team was working on this, they were very, very careful to make sure that they mapped one-to-one -one exact items. And in those places where there was not a one-to-one, -one, they didn't map it, okay? So there's no defined mapping. Because remember what we're doing here, this mapping is what's going to build that whole conversion table, if you will, during that upgrade weekend. So if they weren't one-to-one, -one, we certainly didn't want to convert. Whatever we map here is going to convert over upgrade weekend. So for this one in particular on this row, after the upgrade, so this, these items are actually active patient problems. These are problems on active patients in your production environment. Okay, and so we want to make sure that the information is correct, that the clinical data is correct after the upgrade. So what this column tells me is that I have 45 that I'm going to have to take a look at myself, that it wasn't a clear one-to-one, -one, and Allscripts wants me to take a look at it as a client and decide what I want to do. Now, sometimes we're going to want to map it. Sometimes we're going to want to leave it, and you'll see why. This next column flagged for additional review. Now, you'll see here now I have nothing because what I did is I went back into our, our PMT and I cleared out the things that I wanted you to see exactly what it would look like the very first time you were to log in to the problem mapping tool. So you think I wanted you to see it and think about I've downloaded my tool, I've, or excuse me, I've downloaded medicine, I've got my latest care guides, I've got my latest note forms, I've done all the cleanup work we're going to talk about at the end of the webcast, I have ran my frequency report, and now I'm looking at my dashboard. So in that case, the first time you log in, you're not going to see anything flagged for additional review because that's going to be something once we start the mapping. Now, this approved, again, this column is very important because right now we haven't approved the All Scripts mapping file. Okay, so right now we're just looking at our dashboard saying, what is it in my environment as things are would already be mapped if I accept that mapping file as it is. And again, you can see the items that it pertains to. You'll notice, remember when I was saying that, so this can, is the build piece. Remember, this is that second one, and this is the first one. As we go into our actual mapping management and start mapping things, as this number increases and I begin to map things, these numbers will also increase. They trickle down, okay, into these. Over here, this is our diagnosis mapping based on frequency. And now what we're talking about here is charge. Again, this is a really the important column here, excuse me, the important row here. What we're talking about here of all my charge items, all those items that I have built against charge, what is the mapping? This one's going to be lower. You're going to see this one's lower, all right? So the same process here that we see, 
And then you can see again, as we begin to map things on this row in here, it will trickle down and increase our percentages in here. All right, that's our dashboard. Now, let's go over here and actually take a look at the mapping management. And this will give you a little scary when you first log in. I'm going to just push this over here so that we can see it a little better. And I want to explain to you what you're seeing here, okay? You'll notice again, three tabs. Again, remember what I said, three places, three levels that will have to be mapped. And here they are. This is when it pertains to your instance data. Again, the build of your problems and those that have to do with diagnosis. On this particular screen, what we're seeing now is what it has returned for us. And let me explain what we're seeing. It is showing me that in my little sandbox, in my little pretend environment, I have hypertension as an active problem on 23 patients, okay? You'll notice that I've got it, it basically, you can do the filter from your highest frequency to the lowest, which would make sense. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But what I want to show you here is that I have got 23 patients that have hypertension as an active problem in my production environment today. Medicine. This is the medicine problem. Okay, so everything that you see over here in kind of this gray-black is medicine. And what you see over here in green is going to be the after upgrade 11.4 IMO items. Okay, so right now I know that the, this particular medicine term is linked to this ICD-9, and what this is also showing me that as part of that Allscripts mapping file, Allscripts has mapped it to the IMO term hypertension, and the IMO, remember that company, they basically have this same term mapped to the same ICD-9 and the new ICD-10. Okay, and this goes this all the way down. You can see this is what's happening. Now, you'll notice when you look at these, it's like, well, they match. They match. Well, of course they do. Remember what we talked about. The clinical content team did a great job of going in and making sure that they did a one-to-one -one match on this, all right? We want to make sure so that after the upgrade, if we accept this mapping, all those 23 patients that had hypertension on their chart, after the upgrade, they still have hypertension on their chart. This is what it looks like. I don't want you to worry about this ICD-10 column now. Remember, we're mapping these terms. And they happen, and, and, and again, this particular company has gone one step further and not just, not just map, not just showing that their IMO has the ICD-9, but also it has the ICD-10s, where what we're seeing in medicine currently is just the ICD-9. Now, again, it's showing me everything in here that was mapped from all scripts, all right? And you can see these different columns. You can see what the new description would be if I choose not to use the all scripts mapping, and I define it, that would be this column. As we're working through, and maybe um, we're working through our individual mappings, I might want to just click this box because I want to come back to it for some reason. We'll talk about the problem search. This is going to show us what our map status is. These two here, basically these columns, become updated as you run the frequency, and it's letting you know when the last time this was updated, which is important once you start actually approving these mappings. Okay, And then also this last column where... Before the 1.006 mapping file came out, there was a, I think it was 1.002, it might have been 4. Um, in any case, once we ran that new mapping, if you had already started your mapping, there would actually be stars in this column where all scripts was letting you know, well, you took a new mapping file against something that you've already mapped, basically an alert to let you know perhaps you want to check and look at this mapping now. It was interesting, one of the first we had actually started mapping with an older mapping file because this 1.06 was not available yet. And, of course, there were a lot of things that either we didn't like the mapping or we knew they needed to be different. So we had done 
client defined mappings. And so this um, new mapping file came along, and it was interesting. Just about every single new mapping that all scripts had put in there was one that we too had pointed out. Went mm, don't like that one, don't like that one, and changed it and made our own client defined. So if we'd have waited for the mapping, the new mapping, we'd probably saved ourselves some time on those first few clients. But in any case, it's a good thing because at least we, you know, they're out there now. Um, let's also talk about what you see here. In this particular view, so be very careful when you're looking at these numbers. It's changing these numbers based on this view, this active view, if you will. So what it's showing here is 194 records, basically 194 rows, if you will, 194 problems. And of those, 81% of them have an all scripts defined mapping. And... 36 of them or 18% do not. If I start changing some of my filters, you're going to see these numbers change. So be careful of that when you're working in here. The other thing is you can export this view to a Excel so you can work on it. Let's talk about some of these buttons at the bottom here, what these are. Now, as part of the first step when you actually start working in your problem mapping tool, you're going to have to make a decision whether or not you're going to accept the mappings as all scripts is delivered in that file. And it was interesting early on, a lot of clients had this idea that they needed to take that mapping file from all scripts and check it row by row by row. As a matter of fact, let me just show you what that looks like. I think this would be a good time to show you. Okay, I've changed to an Excel. I hope it's switched over for you guys. I'll slow down just a second. Sometimes there's a little lag. This is actually the mapping file, the medicine to IMO mapping file. And this information is available to you on Client Connect where you can go in and take a look at it. But again, 5,000. Okay, now I know at first at 60,000 feet when you start thinking about it and you're thinking, oh, I'm going to check what this IMO company did. I'm going to make sure everything they did right. Really? Really. Because the likelihood that you would have every single one of these problems on your production patient chart is probably pretty slim. And if you do, it's probably only going to be on a minuscule amount of patients. That doesn't make sense to do that, really. And, and let me show you why. When we go back in the tool here, that's why we have this frequency number. Why do we really care about those problems? We don't really care about those problems that aren't on our patients' charts because we're talking about the conversion. Once the upgrade's over and we begin to add new problems to our patient, we're going to be searching for those problems against IMO. Right now what I'm concerned about is my patients in production, what's on their chart. And I want to worry about the frequency of these. In a real client's environment, when you start pulling these numbers back, what you're going to see is 70,000 patients with hypertension. And that number will start to go down. 63,400 patients with hyperlipidemia. 30,000. You see where I'm going with this. The numbers will start to go down. 200 patients, 100 patients. And as you start to go down, these numbers will get down to where it's one patient, one patient, one patient. At that point, you really have to start asking yourself, does it make sense to use our resources in that time for that. Because if it's only on one patient's chart, I'm pretty sure that we're not going to worry about it. And if it is, we'll worry about it when we get there, when we get to that patient's chart, if we even see that patient again. Okay? So that's why it's really important here when you decide what you're going to do as far as the frequencies and as far as how far down you're going to go. And at this point, we've already looked at our dashboard, and we already know that if we accept the all scripts mappings as they are, what our, um, for patient instance data, what it's going to be. Now, you have the ability to ch approve all of these mappings at once, and this is what this button is, approve all, okay? And again, this is one of those places where when you first start working in this tool, the first time that Becky and I hit the approve all button here in our test environment, we both got a little weak in the stomach because, again, it gets 
takes a few minutes, it's a little scary, what did I just do? Well, when you really run this against a client environment, against um, all that information, it can take a good while when you hit approve all. It could take 10 or 15 minutes before it actually goes through all these rows and marks them as approved. I highly recommend, if you're going to do that, slow down. Take it a few rows at a time. We can actually do one row at a time. And I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to show you um, basically what these different buttons means or, or these options at the bottom when I do that. So you'll notice that when I highlight hypertension, these buttons become active. So at this point, I can either flag this one for additional review. I'm working through my mapping. I'm not ready to accept that one. I can click that button right there, and it's going to mark it so that later I can surface Again, I approve all here. The reason you see it active now is I could do a shift and highlight several and then hit approve all or hit my approve here if I wanted. I'm going to refresh my little screen here so I get those out. Come here. Again, uh, for, let's just say for some reason I didn't want this one. And this was probably not a good example because hypertension makes pretty good sense. I don't know what else we would put there. Let me find you another one where maybe, hmm. uh, let's see. Oh, well, we'll just come up here. We'll just go back for now. But for whatever reason, let's say we didn't, we didn't want this one, I can hit my problem search. You can hit it from here and actually here or down here, whichever. And then when I do, it's going to bring up the problem, excuse me, the problem map dialog where I can then choose which problem I want. Now this screen will show you the all scripts defined map, and you can see it includes obviously the IMO term, and the ICD-9, and the ICD-10, and at this point I can click use the all scripts mapping, or for whatever reason, let me pull this up here, I could choose some of these. Look at all my options. Got a lot of options here. Remember what I'm mapping to now. I'm mapping to those things that are already on my patient's chart or those things that are part of my build work where I have hypertension associated or linked to a care guide or hypertension linked to a note form, hypertension on a flow sheet, hypertension as an active problem for a patient. Okay. Now, I can also, right now I'm filtering this by the ICD-9. I can click this little box here and choose to filter this by the text. And then you'll notice it changes in here and what we want, okay? And then again, depending on your specialty, you may want to change some of these. Again, you can see in here the little filter, some of your filtering options when you're in here, okay? Let me close this. I'm not going to change anything there. I'm going to highlight this. This button, this clear map button, I wish was way over here. I guess that's another one of those things. Maybe I'll call Larry. Hey, move this over here. So this button is dangerous. Don't confuse this button with unapproved. So watch this. If I was to approve the all scripts mapping here, okay, I've now approved it. You see it's got a map status of checked. All right, so there's my approved mapping. If we go back over to our dashboard, and it's going to take just a second for it to show up on the dashboard. When I come back over here and look at my frequencies, you'll notice now I've approved one. So now I'm seeing that 24 there back over here. If I decide I don't want this one, this is not the mapping that I want, unapprove, 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 not clear map. When I clear map, it clears the all scripts mapping. Now, unless you intend to clear the all scripts mapping, if you don't want it there, if you want to go row by row and do this yourself, but be careful, clear map and unapprove is not the same thing. When I do this, watch what happens. Let's pick one I don't want to work with. How about cough? When I clear map, you'll see this here is the all scripts mapping. It's gone. Now, at the risk of scaring you to death and saying, oh, where did it go? You can get these back by clicking here, 
row by row. There's no easy way currently that if you do that, that you can go back in and say, reapply all of them. Trust me, we know. We've done it in test over and over, trying to break it and fix it. But what you'll see here is when I click on that, it shows me the all scripts defined mapping again. And I could click to use the all scripts mapping and close it. And then we'll see it back on here. But you'll notice there's no way if I had basically cleared out all of them, there's no shift functionality where I can hold them all and tell it to come back in. Okay, it was currently, right now, it's row by row. Okay, so that kind of explains these buttons and what you're doing here. Again, on this particular tab, what you see is the patient instance data and the different frequency information. And you'll read in your checklist that Allscripts um, is basically recommending that you're probably going to want to have a, a a mapping for all those items that are 50 and above. But again, it really does depend on the client. And I'll show you a real client's report card, if you will, in just a few minutes. Now, let's look at these. Remember I was talking about how this one actually comes over into the mapping. All right. So now on this particular tab, what you see here is it's going to show me care guides. So it's basically telling me that I have dental disorders on three care guides. And again, I can choose my all scripts mapping. Okay, that's what that is. I can go one step further and I can see just the ones that maybe I want to work on just my cardiovascular care guides. Okay, I could do that. You'll notice here you see this one has nothing. That's a great example of one of those where all scripts determined that it didn't make sense in this case to map this one. Okay? There were just way too many possibilities. Okay? And they were going to leave that one out there for the client. So in this particular case, that's exactly what you'd have to do. So if we come in here and look at this, whoops. You can see what I'm talking about here in that there's no all scripts defined mapping and that you're going to need to map this yourself. So this is a good time to really answer the question, well, what happens if I don't map it? So after the upgrade, any patient that has this particular problem on their chart as an active problem, if we've chosen not to map it, the problem's still going to be there. It doesn't go away. It's still, they're still going to have the medicine, myocardial infarction arrhythmia as part of their um, active problem list. What will be different is as you begin your workflow. If the provider or someone on the clinical team highlights that problem and chooses to assess that problem, if it's not been mapped at that point, they will be prompted to choose a mapping, they'll get a screen much like this one at that point. The whole purpose, again, of this mapping is so that we have as little of this prompting of mapping happening in our regular work day as possible. But in this case, there's certain times where it may make sense. Because remember, back in the days, back in the days of medicine, some of our choices were pretty limited. If we wanted to document that a patient had a myocardial infarction arrhythmia, this was our this is pretty much our choice. Look at our choices now. Look what is going to be available to our providers and our clinicians after 11-4 with IMO. Look at the choices here. Lots to choose from. And a lot of those do in fact carry the same ICD-9. Some are a little different. Of course this one's going to be different. It's neonatal. This here, again, we can choose to search. You'll notice there's nothing coming back here in this one. So again, we're, we're, we're looking, we're searching here, um, and it's showing us some of our options. So in this case, it may make sense, and this is where after we get to a certain piece of the mapping, where what I call mapping decision points, where we actually may pull an extract of these type of things and give them to our physician champions of the different specialties and say, so for those patients that have this particular problem, do we want to leave it unmapped or 
do you want are they going to choose one of these other mappings okay so all scripts has kind of left that one up to you okay you could definitely do that all right let me close this let's see let's come over here that was some care guide information flow sheets again don't forget whenever you are working in here you hit go it's going to refresh the information in your view all right remember what I was talking about how these numbers change in here and so right now it's showing 40 records it's showing that 23 of these have a defined mapping 17 don't I can go in here if I want and say I want to work on the ones maybe that have I want to check just the all scripts mappings at first and so I can come in here and I can actually change my filter oh excuse me not that one that's not the filter I want I actually want this filter here no I don't boy I'm losing it today aren't I I actually want this filter sorry folks I want the filter here that says blank right here I want something that has no mapping okay and then you'll see what comes up here this one would show me all the ones that all scripts did not define a mapping with well that probably makes good sense let's look at some of these okay especially where it comes to diabetes our options are going to be almost unlimited when it comes to diabetes and IMO and with ICD-10 we already know that but like I was saying here if we wanted to go back and check the ones that all scripts had done we can say non blanks okay and you could we all we're going to see in our view here is just those that have the mapping and then we could work on those and then we could either approve the mapping okay and keep going let's see same thing with your note forms okay and same thing here with master favorites now I want to take a second and talk about master favorites and what's happening here now for a lot of us obviously our meds our master favorites have we've had since early medicine we might have had them from version 9 version 10 coming into version 11 right we had these specialty favorites um, some from a zip file some that came with our gold database whatever it was we had these specialty favorites now with the upgrade all scripts has begun to create a zip file that can be loaded during the upgrade weekend that will include favorites that are IMO terms okay so master favorites right now I think there's probably about 10 specialties so you're going to want to keep up with that but during your upgrade um, as you begin to work with your upgrade consultant there's a whole process for this that you'll need to make a decision about but one of the things that um, we do as we start through our problem mapping is we start taking a close look at these specialty favorites and what they mean and the user favors keep it in mind again that if it's not mapped after the go live they won't be there well when you first say that to someone they get a little scared about it but let's stop and think about what we're doing here if we've already gone over and we know that in our dashboard that we finished all of our mapping we've done our approval and we know that 90 percent of our patient active problems have been mapped and that our user favorites are maybe only at 37 percent this is when the all scripts um, upgrade consultant and and the and yourselves will need to actually get in and do some filtering dig a little deeper to see what's going on in there okay um, when we talk about the master favorites if you're going to choose to take that mapping file during the upgrade weekend which is highly recommended then this is one of those rows you're not going to have to worry about meeting that recommendation remember in our checklist that recommendation for specialty favorites was 75 percent okay but you're not going to have to worry about that um, again same thing with user favorites if you're going to choose to use um, that master we already know what we've got here is 90 percent of the user favor um, excuse me of our patient instance data so if we haven't used it and 90 percent of our patients my guess is it wound up on some users favorite list because it got loaded there by a master list 
or someone thinking they needed it. But at this point, if it wasn't mapped, because remember, it would be mapped. If it's in here, it got mapped. So what we're talking about over here is this many problems that are mapped, but they were never used on a patient's chart. So maybe we don't want to worry about mapping them. What happens after upgrade, this particular user, if this was one user here, is going to log in and not have those favorites. Let's expand this a little bit so this will make a little bit more sense again. You'll notice here, let me open, push this one. When we start talking about these, and you can open them up here, you can see the different um, percentages by specialty, okay? And you can see what we've got here. I want to show you something right now while we're at this point to make my point about these favorites. Let's see here. Give me just a second to switch gears. Okay. So this is actual information from a patient, excuse me, <laughs> from a client that Becky and I did the mapping for earlier in the year. And we do a report card, if you will, weekly as we're working through these things, where we start, where we are, there's certain questions that we want to ask the client. But this was, this was at the end. This was basically at the end of our mapping. They were ready to turn it over to their upgrade consultant. And at this point, as you can see, we had mapped to 96% of their patient problem instance data. Yeah, we're a little type A. Yeah, it said 80%, but we got all excited. We went all the way to 96%. But the point here is you'll notice that by doing that, look at our user favorites and look at our specialty favorites. Even having our patient problem instance data mapped to 96%, remember what we're saying here, we have mapped 96% of those problems that are currently an active problem on patients in our production environment right now have been mapped. Uh, medicine to IMO, they are ready to be converted, a clean conversion upgrade weekend, right? But in doing so, we still fell below that 75%. Now, this is when the upgrade consultant is going to look at these numbers and go a little further in and realize that's okay. It really is okay because look what we did here. Remember all the different filters within your problem mapping tool. So what we did at this point was, you can see again what we're, we're saying that the user favorites were only mapped to 65%. But we have the ability in the tool to go in and filter. And we asked the system basically, run us the frequency and show us the number, show us the problems, if you will, that have a frequency of greater than 200, okay? So in this particular client, we went in, set the filters. I'll show you where to do that. Um, and said, show us every problem that is on at least 200 users' favorite list, okay? So it did. And there were, at this point, we see 1,455. And remember what I showed you on the top of that screen, the top of your problem mapping tool, where it then shows you, based on that view, what your percentages are? So of the users that had a problem, uh, that same problem on at least 200 users' chart, excuse me, list, 93% of them are mapped. 93% of all active problems that are on at least 200 users' active problem favorite lists are mapped. 7% aren't. My guess is they've never been used, they're never going to be used, and that's good enough. On this particular client, our Allscripts upgrade consultant agreed that was good enough. And the same thing here. So sometimes it's not just enough to look at these top numbers. You've really got to get in and take a look at what's behind these numbers. Let me go in and show you. And I apologize for jumping back and forth. I hope my screens are moving fast enough for you. But I really, there's just so much I want to show you and share with you. I'm trying to get it all in. So again, in here, remember, if I'm in my frequency data, okay, and I wanted to go in and do those filters, we can do that same thing. I can tell the system, I can click here and do custom, 
And I can basically tell it to show me all frequencies. So you see my numbers over here. They go down. Let's just tell it 10 for giggle's sake. So for anything that has a problem that's greater than 10, okay, and I hit okay, and then you'll notice what comes up and shows me. Now, look how interesting how this changes. Remember what I said, our view is going to change here based on what we have. So in this case, same thing I was just saying about the other client. When we said show us you know, the problems with this many things, this is what came back. So the same thing here. And you could do the same thing with the amount of problems. In this case, we would say that everything that has a frequency greater than 10 has been mapped to 100%, okay? There's no undefined mappings. Be careful with this. As you start to play with these, okay, you're going to want to refresh. And this is where you do it because a lot of filter settings. Now you'll notice what happens when we change that, this number changes again. I wish I had more user information in here so that I could show you those frequencies a little better, but that's what I was talking about. Remember, I changed that. Don't forget to hit the go. Let's see what our numbers come up here. And it's been a little slow now. It's telling me I'm just doing way too much. <laughs> it's taking just a second. Okay. So now what you can see is I've asked the system to show me active problems that are on user favorites. Okay. You can see the numbers here. So again, it's saying, oh, only 67% of any of your active problems that are on user's favorite list have actually been mapped. But again, this is what I was talking about. We changed the filter. So what if we tell the system, well, then show us how many have been mapped that are on that are something that are greater than six, for example. Again, come over here. I'm going to do my custom. I'm going to say equal to or greater than the six. Hit OK. Give it just a second. And again, now you see my numbers change. 84%. Okay? All right. Still some more things I want to touch on, so I better hurry. Um, let me go back over to my PowerPoint. A couple of things to think about. Keywords and quick sets. Neither of these are part of the conversion. Okay? Neither one of these are part of that conversion. Remember what we were looking at earlier when we talked about those things that are going to be converted as part of our build. Care guides, note forms, um, flow sheets, specialty favorites, user favorites, keywords and quick sets. So if your organization is using these, then you need to work with your upgrade consultant now to start working on a plan for what, how you're going to handle this. And a lot of this work may be done that upgrade weekend. Okay, there may be some items where you're going to rebuild them, rebuild some quick sets for specific users or for a group of users, and load them via SSMT. There's a lot of things we have to think about, again. So if that's the case, I want you to be mindful of those. When it comes to no forms, remember when I said about that expert-only database or that transfer-only database? It's important to leave that here because our problem mapping tool, when it delivers back our frequency information, if that database is still there and you have taken the latest note form release, those numbers are more accurate at that point. The only numbers that are going to show up as needing are the only note forms, HPI problem note forms, they're going to show up as needing to be mapped are those that you have, as the client, have customized yourself. Now, if you are using the HPI problem note for it from, from all scripts and you have not customized them and you have taken that latest update, then you're not going to have to worry about your HPI problem forms. If you have customized them, the recommendation is you're going to have to go back in and map about 90% of these. All right? Problem note forms, not the assessment note forms. The assessment note forms is an entire different animal that will be handled 
up through your upgrade consultant and will be handled during that upgrade process. Currently, the plan was to upgrade, uh, excuse me, make those changes to the assessment note forms in your test environment, and then over the upgrade weekend, move those via CMT. But on the last two upgrades, there have been some issues, and it was quite frankly just easier to do it. I do know there's a ticket out there to be fixed, and I know Allscripts is working on it. But right now, just keep in mind, these are things you're going to want to plan for, okay? Um, when we talk about care guides, again, same thing. Remember, I want you to take the latest and greatest release of the care guides, and if your organization has taken that, 20, I think it's 2012-3 if I'm not mistaken, if you've taken that latest um, upgrade, that latest upgrade of care guides includes the IMO, all right? And during that upgrade weekend, and again, there's not going to be anything that you have to do, and the pretty neat thing about it is, as you'll actually have a screen that will work through that upgrade weekend, and you'll have the ability to accept the new care guide that has the IMO without having it overwrite your monograph, your order sets, or your template details. There's actually a checkbox where you can choose one of the three of those to either overwrite or not overwrite. Okay, so that's for your care guide. So you're going to want to have some a conversation with your upgrade consultant about that. Now, uh, charging counter forms, I want to go back in here and show you something before I give you a little warning about these. And before we start talking about charge here, and I know we're running out of time. Okay, remember, whatever I'm mapping here is going to trickle down. We're talking about charge here. The Allscripts recommendation for exploding sets is 100%, and that makes perfect sense. If we're going to be using charge and exploding sets after the upgrade, we've got to have these things mapped. This is one of those situations where you absolutely are going to have to understand your workflows before you take this upgrade. What are we using exploding sets? Are our providers actually going to that charge and counter form and clicking the diagnosis from that diagnosis tab and, and entering it there? If they are, then we are going to have to make sure that we've mapped this number accordingly. Are our providers going to subgroups on that charge and counter form and going down and choosing their diagnosis from this subgroup? Or is your workflow such that your providers are actually clicking on the problem from the note or assessing it from the clinical desktop and having that diagnosis then populate the charge and counter form? If that's the case, then you're fine. You're not going to have to worry about all of these numbers. This is where it's going to depend about your workflows. Again, the master favorites are going to change, the personal favorites. You have absolutely, this is the one place I feel strongly that you're going to have to get your billers involved in this particular pit place um, to understand what those workflows and what's happening here. The other thing I want to point out here is you'll notice it's telling you here the things we're talking about converting build charge data. So we're going we're gonna to convert everything that you currently have as a master charge item on a medicine to IMO. We're going to convert your user, your exploding sets, patient path deck diagnosis, and your subgroups. You know what you don't see on here? Your current charge encounter forms. Those encounter forms from maybe today, it's Friday, we're going to be upgrading this weekend. We've seen 25 patients today, and we're going to be, um, we'll have these charging counter forms. The conversion tool, the conversion that weekend, it's not going back and converting those, okay? Now, my understanding is Allscripts is actually working on a process with the, and I think it's actually already ready, um, where your tech ops and your upgrade consultant will work with you that weekend. But it is also recommended that this is another one of those places where you are you absolutely need to start thinking about this right now. Because I can tell you what will happen if you haven't taken that into account and you have a lot of charging counterforms sitting out there in a hold for review status, or maybe it's just even still on the provider's, he's clicked the problems, he hasn't finished everything. Keep in mind what it's doing. At this point, 
it's not going to recognize it. It's just there, those problems aren't going to be available, those medicine problems. And literally, we actually had a client who had to click on every single one of those and re-enter all the diagnosis after upgrade. Now, again, I understand that there's now a process during that weekend, but these are those things that I want to make sure that you go out and have this conversation with your upgrade consultant. They're aware of it. They'll work with you to um, prepare for this. All right. Um, I know Becky's like, we've got questions coming. So uh, a few more things before you start this again. As you can see, a really smart thing to do is go in and clean up those items. Before you actually start doing some mapping, go into your production environment and start cleaning up things. If you're not live with care guides, make them inactive. If you're not using the problem forms, if you've got exploding sets out there that you haven't used in 15 years, it, inactivate them, get rid of them, because all that information is going to be showing up in your problem mapping tool data, okay? We want to get rid of that stuff. Um, just a few more things. Um, again, I mentioned that the problem mapping tool documentation is on Client Connect. Here's some of the information. Again, really good information. Here's that uh, the Allscripts Upgrade Resource Center that I mentioned, where you're going to want to go and make sure you're a part of this. Um, I think Becky has a poll now, if I'm not mistaken. I do. Thank you, Rita. Wow, that was a lot of information. Um, I'm going to go ahead and post our second poll question. And you should see it popping up on your screen now. As most of you or many of you probably know, um, here at Galen we offer some of the industry's best resources. Um, and we'd like to know, do you want someone from our sales department to contact you about possibly engaging with us um, to complete your problem mapping for your organization? I'm just going to go ahead and leave that poll open for just a minute or so. And people are still responding. Answers are trickling in. And we're still getting a few. All right, it looks like everybody's responded. I'm going to go ahead and close that poll. All right, and that brings us to our question and answer section. Um, it's the end of our presentation, and as promised, we're going to do some Q&A. Um, during the web chat, I have been collecting your questions, and we'll do our best to get through all of them, but we are running really short on time. Um, but do note that any questions that we receive, um, we will be posting the questions and answers out on our public wiki along with this slide deck. So question number one, Rita, that I saw come in, um, how many certified coders should I assign to this project? <laughs> Boy, we get that question a lot. Um, so as you might remember that I mentioned a few minutes ago on uh, when I was talking about charge, and I said this is the one place. Um, well, I feel strongly, and I think you'll agree, Becky, as we've gone into this, I think all of us kind of came into this process thinking, oh, we've got to have coders, we've got to have certified coders doing this. And the fact of the matter is the people that you need doing the initial mapping of this is those people who have – a intimate knowledge of the enterprise product. They understand the active problems. They understand the list. They understand the um, the way that the terms are used. We're not worried now about ICD-10. We're not worried, especially in those first two areas, about the actual ICD-10 piece of this. We're worried about those clinically relevant terms. So honestly, I'm trying to to say that you want certified coders on this, I just really don't think that that's necessary. When you get to that third section, absolutely, you've got to have your billing team in there. You're going to have to have certain, um, your billing manager, you're going to have to have those people as part of it. So another question that, that came in is something we've certainly heard from a lot of clients. Um, how long does it take to complete the mapping? <laughs> Um, I don't know we're going to get this question. <laughs> so, boy, uh, 
That's a really good question as well. And I think you can see from what I was showing you today, a lot of it, I mean, it is very client specific. And I think early on, even all scripts, you know, they tried to give you an idea of how long it was going to take, but it's tough. There's just no, there's no clear answer on this. It depends on your database. It depends on how many, um, how long you've been live, how much um, clinical information is in your works database, how many users you have, how many providers. It depends on the amount of charge information that you've built. Are you live with V11 Note? Have you customized note forms? Have you made a lot of changes to those things? All of that is going to play into that exactly. It's also, it plays into um, how much, how far down that frequency list you feel like you need to go. So it's really tough. I will tell you that just having people ask us this so many times, I felt like we needed to go back and at least try to come up with a number. And so we went back and looked at some of the ones we've done. And on an average, um, I'd say the minimum, minimum, and I'm talking fingers to keyboard mapping, the very minimum was 100 hours. Closer to 150, the 100 hour client of just actual finger to keyboard mapping, it probably took us, that took about 100 hours with somebody who wasn't live with note forms, didn't use flow sheets. Um, for those people with note forms, it was closer to 200 hours. So it really is dependent. It really is. Every client is different. So, I mean, I hope those numbers help. I know everybody wants to get an idea of it, but. It really does depend on the specific client and your workflows. And Rita, we have one more question. Um, we are not live with care guides and notes yet. Do we still have to take those updates you were referring to? No, actually, if you're not live with those, you're not going to need to take those updates um, for the medicine, excuse me, excuse me, not for medicine, for the care guides and note forms. If your organization is currently not live with notes or care guides, you can take them, it's not going to, but you can actually wait and take them after because the whole bottom line is that your upgrade consultant is not going to be worried about those two areas. And so while, yes, I did say you need to take those before you install the problem mapping, if you're not live with it, it is definitely something that you can do after the fact, and you don't have to worry about doing it now. Great. Um, I don't have any other questions in right now, Rita. Okay. Um, well, then I want to take just a second, a couple of housekeeping items. For those of you who have joined our webcast in the past, um, you might have received a email. It would have come from SurveyMonkey. So just if you if you're chuck your um, email or your junk mail folders for me, I'd appreciate it. But it is from us. It's from SurveyMonkey. And it's just a question. It's just kind of a survey about our webcast and some of the things you might want to see in the future. So if you wouldn't mind just checking to see if you have gotten that email. And the other thing is that, of course, the Allscripts client experience in Chicago is in August, and we will be there, Galen, and we are in booth 310 this year, and I will be in the booth, and I would love it if you guys would come by and see me, say hello. We can talk about problem mapping tool. We can talk about population health. We can talk about whatever you want to talk about. Just come by and see me, and this is the booth number. And other than that, I think I'm done. I want to thank all of you for joining us today, and I'm going to turn it over to Becky. So we do, on behalf of Rita and myself, we do thank you for joining us. Um, and if you'd like some more information about the services that Galen can offer to you, visit us at www.galenhealthcare.com. Have a good afternoon, folks. Thanks, everyone.